my name is Jesper Hall. I'm from Sweden, and just like John said, I'm here representing the European Chess Union uh, Education Commission that I have been running since 2014. And uh, I was just re-elected for the forthcoming four years to try to develop chess and schools in uh, Europe. Uh, with this presentation, I will continue what Malcolm and John just presented, uh, because I would like to show to you why I think that this work that we do, that all the, of you do, and why it is so important. Uh, I was uh, making a switch uh, of myself from training talents, because that's what I've been doing since uh, 20 years back, trying to develop the best methods to make children as good as possible in chess, but about 10 years ago, I made a switch to try to do something else, to try to, to develop the society with chess as a tool. And uh, I have four kids myself, and I think that if you have kids, you start to think about how to make them ready for society, and how can I, as a father, help them to grow and uh, to develop the skills that they need to be ready for what is waiting. And. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm representing uh, ECU, and um, uh, we have been discussing a lot. We have had now uh, one day of meetings with the advisory board of professors from different, of different areas and different countries of Europe to, to continue, because what I want to do is to take chess in schools and how to teach chess uh, to be an educational tool to a new level, to put a new standard. And, uh, of course, we are facing challenges, you know, because we have uh, an educational system that is moving into the digital era very much. Malcolm mentioned the artificial intelligence that will be part of our lives, uh, and, and we don't, but we don't know really how. And I will also try to, with this presentation, answer the question why chess could have a role to play in the future. First of all, Right now, it's quite a big debate. What does the future really look like? What are we preparing our kids for? Uh, because we're, you know, we are confronting with very rapid changes in the society, you know, the social conditions. Um, there is a lot of uh, researchers that says that the forthcoming 20 years, the upcoming 20 years, will bring more changes in the structure of human society than the previous three years, 300 years have done all together before. What does that mean? Uh, we heard John speaking about the, uh, the educational system and the ideas that they have at their schools. And, of course, how could school children of today, what kind of jobs, for example, in the future will they have? Because probably they will look very different from the jobs we have today uh, for different reasons, you know. And there have been a lot of discussions among researchers that says that probably 50% of the jobs we see today will, do, will be automated. And uh, 30 to 80% of the jobs will no longer exist, the ones that we see today. Of course, this is a huge debate. How many years will it take and how much will this actually influence what we see? But there is no, day, no doubt that we are facing big changes. One of the things is the automation, that when machines will be operating other machines. And to some research that I've been speaking to, they say that this change, this will be just as big as when the Industrial Revolution came around uh, in the year 1800. And into their lifetime, today's children will have you know, just about 10 different types of jobs with 40 different places of work. It will be like, more like you're running different projects all the way through your lives and not like with most people of the early generations that stuck to one kind of job all the way through in their lives. You know. So, how do we prepare our kids? What, what does I try to do with my, my kids, my four kids? How can I prepare them? Or what is with the skills that are needed? If these are the if these are the changes that they will be facing when they grow older, you know. And um, many researchers talk about the four C's that these are the skills that will be needed in the future for the kids. And it's critical thinking and problem solving. It is communication to be able to be a good communicator. It is the ability to collaborate with others 
and not the least you need creativity and innovation because these are the jobs that will be left out for us human beings when the artificial intelligence take over and so on. These are the skills that are needed. So the question is how can we prepare our children for this future? And not the least the educational methods that we, you know, that the presentation we just had. Of course, we constantly must update the way that we teach. We must be open-minded to uh, new ways of training these four C's. And not the least, we need to adapt um, uh, the needs of the society and the different mindset of the digital, digital native children. So, what kind of burning needs does the uh, 20, uh, 21st century of education have? Uh, well, first of all, the ability to think in systems, that's a skill that will be needed, you know. To recognize patterns, to think critically, to solve problems, to training, or uh, to improve your memory, and not the least, what, and this is a topic we have had in the advisory board of today, is how to transfer knowledge from one field to another. And not the least, the teaching methods must be developed for learning and thinking. One thing that also is, at least in Sweden, under big debate, is that in each subject of schools, the teachers, the principals and the politicians are talking about the need of gamification of the subjects. Uh, and it's a crucial uh, pedagogic method uh, that will be just growing, I think. Not the least, you know, you know, well, I just look at my own kids, you know, they like to play on the, on the net, they like to play their video games and, and so on. Uh, so it's very natural to them to use, um, to use games for learning. Uh, and of course, so children are constantly ready to switch between real life situations and virtual reality uh, of the screen. And with chess, uh, that is a board game, uh, this game is actually training thinking system, system, social behavior, creativity and memory. So I would say that chess fits in very well with these four C's. And not that as it is a game, it's also perfect for the digital era that is about to come. Now, this is the question that we have to answer. But from my point of view, chess is a perfect tool for education in the digital society. As it is a holistic game based on visual thinking. But also, as teachers, has got the choice. They have got the choice to choose if you want it to be a board game or you want to use it through the net. You have the possibilities to choose themselves, yourself. And at least in Sweden, it's quite interesting because a lot of the teachers that I, I deal with, I have, we have uh, 7,000 teachers now in 1,200 schools doing chess in different levels. And quite a lot of them says that they don't want to use our um, digital um, possibilities because they think it's so great that the children are learning to play a board game where they're facing each other and communication through uh, over the board you know but the possibility is there we have the uh, great possibilities to use chess through the net as well that's why I also think it is so suitable for this era as you have got the choice as a teacher and then another thing that I think is probably the most important thing, and in the service that we have done in Sweden with all the schools and, the, um, and their experiences from chess and schools, is that the fantastic thing with chess is that it crosses all borders. It actually doesn't matter what age the children have got, you know, they can play with each other even so. Doesn't mean, doesn't matter if you're a boy or if you're a girl, you can play on equal ground, you know or physical development, disabilities, the possibility to speak Swedish in my case that I work with, but the language of the, of the, of the country, ethnicity, religion or culture. Chess would go over all of this, you know, and this is actually what most of the teachers tell me after just some lessons of chess, that you can, they can see the benefit from this social point of view. So, 
Since 2014, I've been working hard, not the least together with John, that is the Secretary of ECU Education, to try to help the different federations, to help the different organizations working with Chesson schools to develop. Um, and it's very clear that Chesson schools in Europe is very rapidly growing. It's a growing movement. In every country, uh, they have their own way of doing it because well, I usually call it like a, a wild bunch of flowers, these movements of, of around Europe, you know, with chess and schools, because, you know, everyone has got their methods, depending on, not the least, uh, the style of education, uh, depending on um, where the money comes from, and, and so on. Uh, but still, everyone has got something going on, and it's growing. So today, uh, we uh, estimate that about 5 million children have chess every week in the schools of Europe. So, uh, also in many countries, chess is a subject, uh, mandatory or uh, supplementary. Uh, we just had meetings with the Research Institute of Armenia, um, a new chess institute that will work professionally with trying to re make research on chess. And in Armenia, chess has been a mandatory subject since 2011, and um, very popular, of course, you know. Uh, ECU education is representing four, 54 countries, so it's 54 white flowers growing right now. And our goal in ECU education is that we want to help to keep up a new standard of how to teach, because that's actually what everyone is facing, the problems of how to do it in the best way to um, uh, make it grow, make it even better. So what we try to do is actually not only to give chess lessons, but our hope is that we can make Europe a little bit smarter with what we do. Thank you.